Bienvenue à nouveau et uh, merci d'être resté pour cet exposé. Uh, we'll switch to English to welcome our speaker today, Tomer Ullman, who is uh, assistant professor at Harvard and who has just landed this morning uh, to uh, come and give this talk. So thank you very much, Tomer. This is really wonderful to have you here. Um, Tomer is, uh, uh, got his PhD at MIT with Josh Tenenbaum. Uh, Professor Josh Tenenbaum is a leading figure in uh, sophisticated modeling of the human mind and uh, AI using uh, particularly Bayesian inference model. The idea that the, the brain is a statistical engine that can do very sophisticated Bayesian inference and perhaps more sophisticated than uh, current bottom-up neural networks which are very successful in AI. Uh, are. So this is a very interesting discussion whether the brain goes beyond what is currently available to these giant uh, associative machines that we call artificial intelligence today. Um, I, in my book I have argued that we have to take very seriously the Bayesian brain and you might remember that in a previous course we talked about the brain as a statistician, brain as a Bayesian system. So this is part of the philosophy of the group of Josh Tenenbaum, of which uh, Tomer, uh, where Tomer started, but uh, now, of course, has his own group, his own research, and uh, without further ado, the topic of the talk today, how humans develop a simplified model of objects and their physics. Thank you so much, Tomer, for, for accepting you. my invitation. Thank you so much, and hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you, and thank you again for having me, and thank you to the funders, without whom none of what you're going to see is going to be possible. And um, just a few words. Um, je suis désolé de ne pouvoir donner cette conférence en français, mais étant donné mon français, c'est pour le mieux. Um, that's the last French you'll hear out of me, thankfully. Um, okay, so this is the overview for the talk. Here's how it's going to go. The first part is what is your deal, right? What am I doing? What am I studying? Uh, that's going to be just one slide to kind of set the stage of what I'm interested in. Because I'm interested in more than just this talk, and I'm happy to have a discussion about all of it. But the talk will be a bit more focused about um, intuitive physics. So intuitive physics, I'm going to already tell you, I mean, it's the kind of everyday reasoning that we all have about objects and their physics, the fact that you kind of know what will happen if I throw that pen over there. Even those of you who are physicists, and maybe there are some in the crowd, I'm guessing you're not solving Newtonian dynamics as the pen is flying. Well, maybe you are, actually, but not explicitly. So we'll talk a bit about the everyday intuitive physics that we have, from babies to adults, and we'll ask what underlies those computations, right? Um, in the same way that you can look at this and say that it's a pen, but you don't exactly know how you know it's a pen, right? It takes a lot of hard work and billions of dollars and multi-PhDs to figure out how the visual system works to do that thing where you look at it and you see and you say it's a pen. It turns out to be very sophisticated computations. In the same way, I think that's interesting to examine what are the sophisticated, potentially, what are the computations, sophisticated or not, that underlie the fact that you can reason about the fact that if I drop this pen, it's not going to suddenly go up or disappear and reappear over there. Seems obvious, just like it's obvious to know it's a pen, except when you start thinking about it. Ooh, host would like to do this. Yeah. Okay, let me press unmute for a second and see, tell me if that helped or not. If not, I'll yell and somehow hope they'll hear me. Okay, good. So we'll work through a few possibilities for what underlies this computation, and there's sort of a titanic struggle going on right now between several different groups about what this computation might be. I will be presenting my view, um, but also a few of the views of the competition. And within that view, I would like to kind of give you a sense of even if this, that the mind is doing something like a mental simulation. I'll unpack that, what I mean by mental simulation, intuitive physics, all of this will be explained. I'm just giving you a high level overview. But the idea is that even if you think the mind is doing something like a mental simulation, this mental simulation, the argument is it has to be um, kind of approximate. It can't be exact. And that's easy to say, but when you spell it out, that leads to all sorts of interesting predictions. And in particular, things about approximate bodies and partial simulation. And from there, I'd like to start to try to connect that to things like imagination and imagery. So the first part is more about sort of recognition, right? We see the pen and we reason about the pen. And the second part is we imagine what would happen if the pen is moving around and things like that. And the ideas there, again, it turns out maybe approximate bodies and partial simulation have a lot to say to how we reason about these things. 
I'll talk a little bit about non-commitment and visual pretense. And the idea is that as I'm moving through these ideas, I'm going from very established things that way before my time, right? But I have to set the stage because I take it that not all of you have that foundation necessarily. And even if you do, we kind of have to set the stage. So that's, you know, decades old stuff. And it's kind of an inverse tower. Like we're building a tower in reverse where we're going down, down, down. And as we go down, things are going to get a bit more uh, new and fresh and cool. And some of this recent stuff is like now submitted or preprints or things like that. So I'm gonna go from established stuff to current cutting edge things that were submitted last week. Okay, so. Reverse tower. Okay. Starting with what is your deal, um, meaning you, meaning me. So my main interest is in common sense reasoning and intuitive theories, where intuitive theories is this idea, I don't know if you've covered it in other classes. Again, I, I was told to sort of assume, to start out slow and assume sort of not that much knowledge. So intuitive theories is this established idea in cognitive development and cognitive science where there's a question about what is the data structures that are in your mind, right? If we take the central metaphor of cognitive science seriously, the mind is something like, the brain is something like a computer and cognitive scientists are trying to figure out what programs is this computer running? And you can ask, what are the data structures? Is it more like a list or a tree or a dictionary or something else or an artificial neural network, right? And one argument, one very powerful argument, is that one way of organizing some of human knowledge, not all of human knowledge, but some of human knowledge, is to think that the data structures, the knowledge that we have, is similar to how scientists organize the world. So the data structure we should be thinking about is not a list or a tree or a table, it's a theory. And in the same way that scientists, right, again, I'll go back to physicists, or even physicists take their oscilloscope and they point it at something and it goes glip, Right? They're not just interested in figuring out what over the next time frame is it going to go blip or gloop, right? They posit a theory. They say, like, this isn't just pixels on my retina or pixels on the oscilloscope. This is driven by some hidden variables that I don't have access to. I'm going to posit that in the world there are things like electrons, and there's going to be things that move the electrons around, like electromagnetic forces, even though I can't see them. But that's what I think is driving my oscilloscope. And now I can do experiments to verify or nullify that theory and maybe replace it by something else. And the idea in a lot of cognitive development, again, not all of cognitive development, not everything, but not a lot of it is that people, children from a very early age, organize their world according to intuitive theories. So theory, like a scientist, intuitive because we're not exactly doing it explicitly, and yet we are testing, trying things out, building the sort of knowledge structures of the world much like scientists. Again, well-established stuff that I'm just sort of inheriting for the purposes of this talk. But I'm particularly interested in the intuitive theories of intuitive physics and intuitive psychology. So what we as just everyday people, how we reason quickly, automatically about the behavior of everyday objects and other people. And again, I, I sort of said that a bit for physics already, right, with the idea that if I throw the pen at you, you kind of can reason about what will happen with it. But similarly for the behavior of everyday other persons, right, if, um, you know, go into any coffee shop, and I'm sure you'll hear in French, but something like, you know, why did Mary say that? Well, you know, she was probably trying to tell John that she didn't want his help. Well, why didn't Mary want John's help? Well, you know, John, he was being a bit pretentious, but, well, Mary should have known that he's pretentious, blah, 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 right? And the people you know, having these conversations are not necessarily psychologists, but they're reasoning about psychological states. They're reasoning about intentions and beliefs and desires and emotions, things we don't have access to. And the idea is that these are, again, intuitive theories, right? Much as we posit electrons and electromagnetic forces, we posit desires and intentions that are driving the things that we can see. Okay, so intuitive theories. Within intuitive theories, intuitive psychology and intuitive physics are of particular interest as kind of the pillars of common sense reasoning. And within those things, I'm particularly interested in building um, computational models of these things. Again, it's interesting to study these empirically, and of course, many people have, and I have as well, and you'll hear about some of that. But it's also interesting to ask, okay, how do we then take these empirical findings and build this into a computer or a robot or a machine or an artificial intelligence? It's not that I'm so hot on robots per se. I mean, I think it's nice if we have them, that's great. But I think that the idea is as long as we don't have a machine implementation of the things that people can do, we can't say that we fully understand what it is that people are doing. So that's part of what's driving my research program there. I'm interested in tracing this idea through development. So whatever model we posit, whatever program or computational model we posit, better explain things from early starting points all the way to adulthood. 
And yeah, you know, I said I'm not so hot on AI, but I do try to compare all these things to machine learning and uh, computer science and AI. These days, somewhat from a skeptical perspective, like I'm very interested in generative AI and large language models, and I'm happy to talk about it, but I think I adopt a somewhat skeptical perspective, which I think is de jour right now in this room, right? Uh, so that's good. Um, by the way, before I move on, maybe I should ask, um, or I should say, if you're interested, so this is kind of, as I said, my deal. Um, if you're interested in more of that, like the theoretical underpinnings of these ideas and things like that, there's this review piece over here that I wrote with um, Josh Tannenbaum that kind of lays it out and tries to connect intuitive theories and real theories and uh, core knowledge and stuff like that. So just putting that out there. Also, I don't know, what is the, um, what's the policy on questions? Is it like I talk and then 20 minutes at the end? Yeah, okay, good. So I'll, uh, if you have questions just at this point, maybe save them. Great. So that's kind of my deal. Within that deal, I said I'm interested in intuitive physics and intuitive psychology. I'm afraid today I don't you know, have five hours, uh, maybe for the best, so I'm only going to focus on intuitive physics, but I'm happy to talk about intuitive psychology as well. So let's dig into it a little bit. And again, I'm just setting the groundwork here a little bit. I was told to assume um, little knowledge on the part of the audience, but the fact is the audience has a lot of knowledge. In fact, the audience has a lot of knowledge from birth. It turns out, that we know a lot of stuff from birth or from babies, uh, from the, sorry, from the early time when we're infants. And this idea that we have the sort of knowledge about the world from a very early time in our development, possibly even innately, has been put forth, of course, by a lot of people, but one of the sort of um, central modern incarnations of this idea is known as core knowledge. And this is the idea that children have this kind of very early developing or innate knowledge about the world, that this is shared with other animals, that it isn't about, it's not everything about everything. You're not necessarily born with knowledge of carburetors, right? Or how the Ming society operated or things like that. You're, you, but it's not that you're a blank slate. It's not that you know nothing about anything. You know some things about some things. It's a small number of domains, the kind that would make Darwin happy, because it's the kind of thing that you would want to build into many animals, not just humans, right? So this is some very basic knowledge about agents and objects and number and space and social behavior, and depending on you know, what time of day you talk to Liz Spoking, maybe there's a six secret thing over there. But this is kind of the, the standard stuff. By the way, these are all images of my son when he was very young. I didn't have the ones for these things, but so it is. And these are, again, these are general principles about a limited, and, but within a limited domain. So what do I mean by that, right? Well, let me give you some examples. Let's again drill down into within core knowledge that babies have from very early days. Let's talk about what they understand about objects. So the idea of core physics. And again, but you could talk about any one of these other domains. You could talk about core psychology and core number and core space, but within core physics. So again, the idea is, Infants know something about the world. They have expectations about objects. Now, some of you might be surprised about that, right? What? Infants know something from birth, right? I was told by Piaget that they don't have object permanence. Piaget was wrong. Um, he was a genius, but in this case, I think we all can agree that he was wrong. Um, so you might be surprised by this, which is great, because that's what we, this is how we test this. This is how we know that infants have expectations. We surprise them. We bring them into the lab and we show them, you know, either real life shows or videos or scenes or things like that. And we check if they're surprised. And we check if they're surprised by looking at their looking time, by looking at pupil dilation, galvanic skin response, EEG. There's many measures of surprise. They turn out to be kind of mainly loose correlates of looking time. So looking time is kind of the, the usual way that violation of expectation is measured these days. So for example, we might show children, this is gonna be a simplified version, but I'd like to run a violation of expectation task on you for a moment in a much simplified form. So suppose that you're a baby, right? Put your baby hats on and you see the cylinder moving like that. Now watch carefully because I have a question for you. How many cylinders are there in this scene? Who thinks that there's one? Raise your hand. Who thinks that there's two? Raise your hand. Who thinks this is a PowerPoint? It doesn't mean anything. But okay. So yes, and suppose, those of you who said two, suppose that I lower this thing and you realize that there's only one. You might be surprised. And again, this is a PowerPoint, but imagine this is happening in real life in front of you. You would suspect a trick, right? Like this is magic, this can't be. Because why can't it be? Because objects don't just teleport. They don't just disappear, they don't just reappear. 
Right? And again, we can do that. We can show infants these kind of displays and compare them, of course. There's going to be a test and a control where we're going to compare them to displays of an object moving with the same spatial-temporal timing, but it's going to be just a continuous motion, and then we show that there's one object. And so it's the same final scene, but they're not surprised by that, right? obviously. You can do this for things like um, solidity as well. So let me show you an example of solidity. right? So I'm guessing even as adults, kind of, you're not surprised by occlusion, right? The object hasn't disappeared, you know it's still there, except that, oh my God, what happened to Teddy, right? So that's a violation of solidity right there. So there's many of these things that you can do. There's like dozens of experiments over decades and decades on this sort of thing. And this is all organized under the, under the heading of uh, core understanding, core knowledge of physics, right? And this is sort of, we have some, some number of principles that we expect about the behavior of objects, right? Objects shouldn't disappear. They shouldn't reappear. They should follow smooth paths. They should be cohesive, right? They, should be, they shouldn't pass through one another, right? Like gossamer threads. And every one of these statements is very hard one knowledge, okay? And it's supposed to apply to objects in general. Okay, so let me check, uh, make sure there's no water in there. Okay, let me find a solid body. Okay, this one, for example, right? So you know this about pens, that they don't go through this. You don't then need to relearn it as a baby for this thing that you've never seen before. As long as this is an object, all of the expectations about objects will apply to it. You don't need to relearn it over every object, unlike some models out there, uh, which we'll get to in a second. Okay, so that's great. Um, but, you know, I look at that and I'm very interested in it, and there's a lot of empirical work still to be done about how infants reason about this, and we're, you know, I and other people are doing active work on empirically trying to figure out this stuff. But still, you can look at it and say, okay, this is hard-won theoretical understanding of what infants have when they come into the world, and yet. And yet, that's not a computational model. Okay? That's not something, I can't pull up my computer and, you know, okay, what is it, developmentalists? You say objects can't go through one another and they have permanence? Okay, import PyTorch, objects don't go through one another. Like, that doesn't, what do you mean exactly, right? Like, this is not, what do you mean by objects? What do you mean by solidity? You need some way of actually putting this stuff into a computer, and when you start thinking about it, it turns out that there's many ways of capturing that same expectation in different models that look very different from one another in terms of the commitments that they make theoretically. And so before I tell you a little bit more about the models that we've been exploring, let me mention also something about um, intuitive physics in adults, right? So I said core physics from infancy, you don't expect objects to go through one another, but this kind of knowledge about physics isn't, um, you know, some parts of it we think might be innate, but even those of us who believe that some of it might be innate, we certainly are believers that you grow and understand a lot more about physics as you get older. And as a full-blown adult, you have kind of an adult sense of intuitive physics. And adults certainly can reason about a lot of stuff, right? They can reason about how objects um, bounce around and how they uh, drape, for example, and how they crash and how they smash and how they ooze and glorp and slurp and other words that I made up just now. And again, there's a question there, right? Even if you're not interested in development, though you should be, even if you don't care about babies, though you should, even if you're just an AI person who wants to understand what adults are doing, there's a puzzle here, right? That adults have the sense of intuitive physics. They get by in the world really well with their intuitive physics and at a level that is not matched by our current AI. So what is it? What are the underlying computations that we're running, right, that allow us to do this? There's been a bunch of proposals out there, but one of them that has gained traction over the last decade or so is this idea of the game engine. Okay, the mental game engine. You can think of it as a mental simulation in your head. And I'll walk through this a bit more, but for now, uh, maybe the idea to keep around is that there are computer programs that generated every one of these scenes, right? In fact, it's the same computer program. Even though these scenes look very different from one another, visually they seem to be describing different scenes, right? We can categorize them as sort of visually distinct, but the same underlying set of computations generated the motion of all of them. There's a whole world out there of engineers who are trying to build programs without, you know, they don't think about cognitive science. They're just trying to build programs that will generate a reasonable simulated world in real time for the purposes of movies and games and things like that. And the claim here is that maybe the software that your mind is running is similar 
is, an is analogous to the kind of software that uh, these engineers have come up with. Now, why would you want that in your head? So I'm going to try and present later a bit of empirical evidence and what you get from that idea. But before any empirical evidence, I just want to suggest that this is a good idea, just a priori. If you are an engineer, you are evolution, you're designing a dog or a human or a lizard, and I, you know, I used to ask, like, how should I design this human? There are reasons to build in this kind of simulator. And one of them is that you can do simulation, right? and observation, sorry, simulation and inference and generalization. So if you take this program, the simulator, and you give it some input, like the state of the world is this, right? There's an object over here and it's not attached to anything and gravity works this way and it's given some initial velocity, you can predict what will happen to this object, right? In a similar way, you can do inference. You can say like, look, I have, um, as I was mentioning, we, we think in terms of programs and statistical programs, you can say, look, I don't know exactly a lot of things about the world. I have some guesses, right? So these variables, I'm going to put some uncertainties over them. And then I observe the world and now I can realize that like, oh, this block that I thought was very light is actually very heavy. And then I can generalize that. I can go to a completely new scene and I can say what will happen in that new scene. All right. So this idea of the mental game engine, that your mind is running something like um, you know, a piece of software that is akin to the kind of software that engineers have come up with to generate the motion of objects in real time, has been around for a decade now and has been very successful at explaining a lot of things that people do, including the reasoning about solid bodies and their tracking and um, you know, things like fluids and counterfactuals and abstractions and causality and also stuff from infancy all the way to adulthood but it's not the only game in town, okay? So I'm putting it up front because I think people are doing something like that, but it really, really isn't the only game in town. So this thing has been useful and a lot of people have picked up on it in machine learning and AI and things like that, but there have been alternatives. And these alternatives are not just alternatives for machines, they're alternatives for how we think the mind might be doing it, okay? So let me spell those out very briefly. I don't want to give the competition too much time, but I should be fair about this. So for example, you might think, you know, there's various theories out there that come from development, right? These aren't AI people necessarily, like Rene Balajan, right? That think that maybe the way that you learn about physics is much more like a decision tree. And you can think of it in the following way. So suppose that this is, again, humor me, imagine that this is a real table, right? And imagine that this is a block. People can do that, yeah? It's amazing you can do that, by the way, but we'll, we'll talk about that a bit. So imagine this is a table, imagine this is a block, imagine this is a frozen video frame and I'm just about to hit play. Who thinks this block is going to fall down? Raise your hand. Who thinks it's not going to fall down? Raise your hand. Okay, good. Now, again, how did you do that? There are many ways of assessing that. One way of doing that is to just, you know, look at the features here, like the amount of contact between the table and the block. And certainly that's been a proposal for how children seem to learn. So very young infants seem to only expect things to fall down if they're not connected at all. So this is what they expect. But if it's at all connected in some way to the table, even like under the table like that, at early ages they don't seem to expect it to fall down. So there's a process of learning there that has been captured by something like, oh, you learn more features that you need to care about. You know, maybe this tower is unstable. How do I know that? Well, you know, look at the geometry of it. Look at the width, look at the height, right? If the tower is tall, it'll fall. Like, that rhymes, it's a nice heuristic. And if you want to take that kind of heuristic and multiply it by a million features working together non-linearly, you have something like a neural network that can do intuitive physics on the face of it. And that's a proposal that's been out there as an alternative. The only problem with that is that it doesn't work. Um, it doesn't generalize um, reasonably. So if you take this kind of neural network and you train it on you know, things like intuitive physics tasks, like you show it stable towers and unstable towers, and you try to train it. Here's a tower, it's stable. Here's a tower, it's unstable. In much the same way that you would train a neural network to recognize cats and dogs. Here's a cat, here's a dog, here's a cat, here's a dog, Take the same network, here's a tower, it's stable, it's unstable, it's stable, it's unstable. It gets really good at that, but then if you just add one more block, it does terribly, right? Or if you change the blocks to oblongs or things like that, right? There doesn't seem to be any notion of a simulation there or a generalization or anything like that. But still, people have been thinking about this a lot, and especially in like recent years, including top companies like you know, Facebook AI Research, Fair, now Meta, I guess, and DeepMind, Google. They've been spending billions of dollars on machines that are going to try and do intuitive common sense reasoning. And within that, they've taken an eye towards development. Reasoning in much the same way that some of us in cognitive science have that, oh, if we can get our machine to pass the kind of tasks that children can pass, from the data 
the children seem to get. So we're going to give a machine something akin to what a child gets, and we're going to test it in the same way that you cognitive developmentalists test it, then you know, that shows us that the machine has learned some things. So these are some recent-ish efforts from the last three or four years. Um, this is probably from two years ago. Uh, trying to use a generic neural network to try and pass these things without an explicit knowledge of physics. It does okay, we can argue about it, doesn't generalize very well either. This is another example from uh, Facebook. You don't need to examine the details here, I'm just showing this as um, the idea that like people in billion dollar companies have taken seriously the idea that we should look at how babies learn about physics and the kind of tests that developmentalists have run on physics. Okay. So I mentioned that I don't quite believe the competition, right? And I mentioned that I believe something like the mental game engine, which raises the question, you know, how do you learn that game engine? Even if you believe and you don't have to, but the mind is running something like this kind of software that understands something about physics, right? So this, I, I should have mentioned, by the way, the simulator has a coarse understanding of physics, right? Like it can simulate quasi-Newtonian dynamics. So if that's what you're building in, what's the claim? Are you saying the children start with nothing and they somehow learn this Unity <laughs> game engine software or something? Or are you saying that that whole game engine is completely built in, that's a, something that Darwin has provided us with, or something in between? And the claim that a lot of us are going with is that it's something in between. So we take something like the full mental game engine as the adult state, but the claim is that children start out with not nothing, but they start out with a minimal game engine, something that has approximate bodies and approximate dynamics and priors and resampling and memory and tracking. So this is probably going to be the most technical part of the talk from here. If you make it through this, there's going to be kind of a brief break and then we're going to jump more into um, empirical data. But I think it's interesting and important, which is why I'm showing you this. So this is a recent incarnation. Um, this is myself uh, and these lovely people. Um, and Kevin was the one leading it. So ADEPT is standing for Approximate De-Render Extended Physics and Tracking. The idea is we try to put our computers where our mouth is and we try to build a model of kind of a, an approximate, quasi-simple game engine that can pass the same task that I showed you with infants, like the cylinder that disappeared and the teddy bear that got crushed and things like that. So the model works more or less like this. At any given moment in time, you get some pixels, right? You get a scene. And that scene, you go through something called de-rendering. So there is a neural network there, absolutely, and the whole goal of that neural network is to go from that to a disentangled uh, scene representation of the objects. What you're trying to do is you assume you know how the world works, you know that there are bodies in the world, you know sort of approximately what kind of bodies there are, you just need to connect that to the pixels that you're seeing right now. So this gives you a disentangled view of the scene, there are three bodies here, you de-render each one of them, you sort of try to say where each one of them is, how big it is, what's the initial physics on this stuff, and you assume that you know basically how physics is, okay? So now you have an internal game state. What can you do with this internal game state? You can do a lot. One thing you can do is predict the next time step. Now, as you're predicting the next time step, time doesn't wait, right? Time gives you a new image, and you can again de-render that image and compare it to your prediction. Notice that these comparisons are not happening at the level of pixels, okay? We're not comparing like this blue pixel to that blue pixel. We're comparing a much more general expectation that there will be an object over here. And if there suddenly isn't an object over there, that's a violation of the way that this engine works and requires some resampling over the scene. Okay, and you keep going like that and we created a kind of a test set that is similar to what infancy, except it's something that computers can eat and we create these sort of surprising scenes and unsurprising scenes that are matched for, you know, low-level features and things like that. But one of them, hopefully, our machine should return some number that the negative log likelihood is uh, higher so that it's more surprising than that other one. We created a test suite that is, you know, basically where we think four-month-old children are, roughly, roughly, roughly speaking, right? Things like um, scenes that are about creating and vanishing. This thing is called overturn. Each one of these is sort of a different kind of physical principle, a different kind of surprise, a different kind of scene. And then we test it. Now, how do we test it? Well, we, we, importantly, I should say, we, we, there is some training in this thing. So the only learning step in this model is to train the vision part. So the vision part has objects are sort of moving around and you learn to disentangle them. There's no sort of collisions. There's no things overturning. There's no need to understand solidity or stuff like that. And then you're tested on something very different to what you see. You see this kind of occluder go up. You see this ball going like that. You see the screen going down. And again, what is going on, right? Like hopefully you were a bit surprised by that violation of solidity. 
You can see that also for two objects enter, this is the infant Thunderdome, two objects enter, one object leaves. And you might think, well, you know, that object is still, no, it's not there anymore, oh no. And so on and so forth, okay? So we can create a whole bunch of things that you didn't see in training and we can see how well our uh, model does on it. And I'd like to sort of show you the, um, you know, this is kind of something like the state representation of this object. So first of all, this is the scene that now the object gets, right? So two objects enter, one object leaves. That's not surprising, maybe necessarily just yet. And then hopefully around there, you should be surprised. Now here I'm going to show you kind of the internal tracking mechanism. This is a particle filter, which is keeping track of the objects to give you some sense of the uncertainty, right? And notice that it still continues to exist behind the occluder. Right, so again, Piaget was wrong in that sense. We still think things exist behind occluders. The only problem is when the occluder comes down and now you can look at the surprise, right? So the surprise of the model is basically like, there's a little bit of a surprise when it didn't come out. That's weird, why did it not come out? But then there's a very big surprise when the object is not there when it should be there. Similarly for like one object enters and two objects leave, right? So similarly, you might think like, well, you know, that's one object that I'm tracking. I'm not very surprised by anything that's going on here. It's only surprising then. Now you might very well think like, well, the object was there all along. That's not surprising at all, right? That's a double take. So we can test adults on this and we ask them to like hit a space bar as soon as they see something surprising. They hit the space bar as soon as that object and it leaves. And then if you ask them like, was the scene surprising? They say no. So it's kind of like they go back in time and kind of say like, oh, that was surprising. Oh, but actually it's not because, right? So a double take. And finally, let me show you kind of the equivalent of the teddy bear, right? So here this is, you know, again, it's only surprising at a certain point that is the violation of physics, but hopefully you'll notice that there's a moment of double surprise here, right? So that shouldn't have happened. Doubly it shouldn't have happened, right? So and again, the surprising moment is when the physics doesn't make sense, and then that thing shouldn't be there anymore, and then it comes back. I'm guessing about a third of the audience thinks like, no, it's still there, it's just deformed, right? I thought that it was solid, but it turns out that it's squishy. Yes, we can try and capture that individual variance, okay. So we can compare that kind of simulation-based model to neural networks that are generic and don't know about physics and don't know about objects, but get a ton of data, a ton, a ton, a ton of data, and they don't do very well. So I'm summarizing this table for you here. These machines do well when they're tested on exactly the same thing that they were trained, but they don't do well at generalization, and the model that we have does well both on what it was trained and in generalization. We can compare this to humans, and I'm gonna summarize it for you with this, where it says that we're good and they're bad, and that's it. Um, I don't mean to suggest that our model is perfect, by the way, there's many things that we need to do to make it more um, a model of really how people are working, but we think we're on the right track. This is one proposal. It's one proposal from a few years ago. Still working on it, that, okay. So that was about mental game engines in general, and I'm kind of trying to you know, establish my bona fides and say like, you know, I'm a computational person, we build computational models and give you a sense of like the arguments that are happening now about how people reason about bodies. And again, the, the, the two things to keep in mind is something like it's a mental simulation, you're sort of unfolding things in time, one step at a time, kind of like how a simulator in a game engine might work versus something that doesn't really know about physics and is using like features and heuristics and bottom-up reasoning, so simulation versus not simulation. But even if you think that it is a mental simulation, that immediately raises the question, well, what sort of simulator is it, right? And so if you were sort of spacing out and you're like, I came to hear a talk about approximate bodies, I don't go in for this, uh, the stuff that you were showing me just a moment ago, now's your chance to kind of jump back in, because we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk about approximations and game engines, okay? So the idea is that come, come on board with me with a journey, right? Like even, even if you don't accept it, suppose for a moment that the mind uses something like these simulators, this mental simulation, okay? Engineers that have built these simulators, they don't use perfect simulators, okay? So when people, I don't know how many of you play video games or in my case have kids that play video games, right? So Zelda Breath of the Wild is a game that my son really loves. There's like some uh, knight that's moving around and smashing monsters and things like that. And the engineers that have built this game are not simulating quantum mechanics, right? They're not simulating like every little motion of every little thing there. They're trying to get things sort of right. And in trying to get things sort of right, they use a lot of approximations, right? Like to save on time and memory and space and computation. If you need to get the world right, you're a physicist and you need to understand like how two black holes collide and you can spend a hundred years doing that of computation time, go for it. But we need something that works in real time, so we have to take these principled shortcuts. 
And the theoretical argument here is that, look, if engineers have come up with these sort of principled shortcuts again and again and again, they seem to be coming up with the same shortcuts, whether it's in 2D programs or 3D programs, whether it's these kind of um, simulators or those kind of simulators, they seem to be using the same approximations. And if they're trying to create real-time dynamics, and the mind is trying to create real-time dynamics, then wouldn't it make sense that the kind of approximations that engineers have come up with are the same ones that the mind is using? Seems like an interesting starting point, at least, for a cognitive science investigation. Okay, so the idea is that approximators and simulators are going to be working hypotheses for intuitive physics. If you want to know more about that kind of the theoretical argument underpinning this, I'm going to point you to this paper over here, but for now I'm going to just talk about one recent study that was looking at this specifically in terms of approximations of shape. So in, when game engines, again, I mentioned this, like if you were to simulate the motion of this thing in a game engine and you were going to throw it across the room and try to create a kind of, think of it like trying to create a virtual reality simulation of this thing being thrown across the room. You as the engineer would really not care about the fact that this is going like that, okay? For the purposes of recognizing what this is, that this squirts and you know you can use your hands on it, it does matter, right? And maybe it matters that this is blue and things like that. For the purposes of what will happen and when it will hit the ground, you can probably just put an approximate body on this whole thing. And that's what engineers do. So really all objects in these kind of simulators leave a kind of Cartesian dualist life. There's the representation that is called shape that is used for recognition. That's the fine grain information, color, texture, things like that. And then there's another representation that just so happens to occupy approximately the same space that is called the body. And this is a rough approximate representation that is going to be using the rough form and that tracks the physics, the elasticity and the mass. And again, the claim here is that maybe the mind is split up in these two ways. How can we test this? There are of course many ways of testing this. One way is to look at some psychophysics. So we um, try to think of tasks that are going to give us two different answers. If you're using an approximate body, it'll give you one answer. If you're using a fine-grained form, it'll give you a different answer. And what we use is, for example, and, okay, so we're going to use these sort of bodies, and we're going to consider sort of greater and greater approximations. So here, there's sort of no body approximation, right? The dotted lines are kind of like the physical tracking part, and here they're just the same. You can think of it as almost like, um, is shrink wrap a term that people know, right? These like, think of it as like something that you used to wrap your sandwiches or things like that, right? Like, so you can think of it as like, you can wrap it really tightly or you can wrap it sort of like, start to inflate it, right? And you're getting like bigger and bigger approximation. So which is it, if any? And so we're going to be looking at some classic, let's see, oop, there it is, yes. And you can see that the difference between these things is that the distance between the bodies is starting to shrink, right? So here, the distance between the approximate bodies is actually null. They're touching one another. So what we can do, for example, we did a bunch of psychophysics, but one of them is Michottian launching. Who here has heard of Michottian launching, by the way? Who here hasn't heard of Michottian launching? Who here doesn't know what I'm talking about, wants to see the task? Okay, seeing some yeses, some noes. Okay, this is a very classic uh, psychophysics task. It goes back about 100 years or something like that. Um, well, in earnest, maybe a bit less than that, but okay. It works like that. Well, let me just show you, okay? It works like this. You're going to see a body, and that body is going to move another body, okay? Well, or I shouldn't impose my own mental states on it. What you're, really, what you're going to see in the most bare bones description is a body moving, and then stopping, and then another body is going to start moving, okay? And so any claims about causality is the point of the Michaudian launching task, right? You can ask, like, the thing that you ask people is, did the first body, we're going to call it the agent, cause the second body, we're gonna call it the patient, did the agent cause the patient to move? And now you might think that this thing is like, you know, cause is such a philosophical term, like how can you ask that? But people do this and they do this very consistently and they do this very repeatedly and they do this automatically. And you can test this again and again, this has been tested hundreds of times, it's a very specific functional form such that when you see this, you see that as causal. People report that as like, yes, this object caused that other object to move. Fine. If you see some gap, either in space or time, so space, time, the perception of causality drops precipitously. And now we can use that because, again, if we take these bodies that have greater or lesser approximations, right, and we can look at um, two collisions. We're going to take the same bodies in terms of what the perceptual recognition system sees, and we're going to create two collisions, a concave collision and a convex collision. 
And even though the perceptual distance between these bodies is the same, the effective distance between the approximate bodies is not the same. And so basically the claim is that you're going to see these kind of collisions as more causal because the distance between them is smaller, right? And so you can make a very specific prediction about how that'll go. You can see that basically here, this is the distance on the x-axis, right, between the two bodies. There's a drop, right, as you would expect. There's a very specific drop. But there's a difference between the concave collisions and the convex collisions where this is above that exactly as you would expect for these kind of things. And we have a model that basically like fits this and predicts it really well, right? So this is like, um, these are the results, but on top of that you can put like a model let me see if I have the results there. Maybe, uh, sorry, I guess I don't have the, oh, yes, I do. Sorry, my apologies. Um, these are not fits to humans. Sorry, these lines are not fits to humans in the sense of like I'm just drawing lines. These are predictions of the body approximation data. And you can see that it's a right, beautiful um, prediction that lies right on top of another. We can do this with a whole bunch of other psychophysics tests, but they all basically tell the same story. That people, when they reason about physics, don't seem to be using what we see for recognition. They seem to be using something more like an approximate body. Okay. With that, I'd like to move to partial simulation. So partial simulation is basically the idea that um, even if you're using something like the simulator, right, you might still be under certain constraints where you're not moving all the bodies in the simulation. Again, imagine there's like a hundred different balls moving around here and I ask you to like, you know, it stops, now tell me what's going to happen next. You don't have the capacity, the bandwidth, your mind is limited, you're only going to move some of these things. And again, these are things that computers run into as well, right? Like if you try to get your computer to simulate the motion of a hundred balls, it's going to heat up and slow down compared to the motion of one ball. Okay, these are the people who uh, also helped with running the study and especially was led by um, Lonnie Bess. So this is, um, this is actually a good time to kind of step back for a moment and say, you know, maybe it's time to go back to the competition for a moment. I keep being like, you know, people are doing something like an approximate mental simulation. Look at how good it is. Look at how it fits the data. Look at how it matches what children are doing, blah, blah, blah. I think it's important to step back and give you a sense of like, there, this is not the only game in town. There's a lot of people right now who are arguing vehemently against this and think that this is completely wrong. And something that they're basically saying is that like, look, this is their, I'm gonna try and do a good job because um, I think this is really nice uh, science and good work and I appreciate all these people. But, this, but they are in the opposing camp, right? So let me try and give you what they say when they say people are not running a mental simulation, okay? And then I'll explain why I think that they are. So, and I'll relate it to partial simulation. So here's the claim from the opposition. Look, if people are doing something like a physics engine, like a mental simulation in their head, then that should track reality, right? That should obey, in particular, the rules of probability. And one of the things that we know about probability is that the probability of an event is going to be greater or equal to the probability of some joint event, right? Like the probability of A of necessity is going to be bigger than the conjunction or equal to the conjunction of A and B. Right, some of you may already be familiar with this with um, Linda the feminist bank teller from many years ago. This is a classic stuff about the conjunction fallacy in cognitive science. So they're trying to basically create this idea, this violation. They're going to create a violation of this equation in people. They're going to show that people don't obey this thing. And they're going to conclude from that that people are, can't be running a mental simulation because otherwise this equation should hold. So how do they test that? They show people these sort of two, you know, 2D simple iPad games of objects moving around. And they ask them questions about it. So there's like a cannonball that's being shot up and there's a pink sphere that's falling down. And they ask them things about events. Like let's call the event G is that the sphere lands on the grass. And the event H is that the cannonball hit the pink sphere. And now I can start to ask you about these events in separation or jointly, right? I can ask you like, what are the odds that the sphere lands on the grass? And you can give me some, you know, some number, some, you could hum to the degree that you're certain. There's all sorts of ways that we can assess this. But again, people are relatively consistent here. I could ask you about a conjunction. I could ask you, what are the odds that the cannonball hits the pink sphere and the pink sphere lands on the grass, right? That's a conjunction of two events. And you can see that, the, you know, it must be the case that this thing is either greater or equal to that, right? Because this includes that. And it turns out that through many, many repeated tests, it's not the case. So people seem to show a conjunction fallacy where the probability that they associate with that conjunction the probability of the cannonball hitting um, the pink sphere and the pink sphere landing on the grass is greater than the probability of the pink sphere landing on the grass. You need to do this in separation with people. You can't show them both of these at the same time or they'll realize the trick. 
Now that's, you know, okay, fine. So intuitive physics and the mental simulators are dead and the conjunction fallacy killed them, except not so fast. Why not so fast? Well, because as I have been trying to say throughout this lecture, people are only using an approximate simulation. And one of these approximations is that you don't necessarily move all the bodies in your simulation. This is a partial simulation. And in particular, you can say like, look, how likely is it that the pink sphere will end up on the grass creates sort of two possible worlds. You can either just not move the cannonball at all. You're just reasoning about the pink sphere in and of itself. And there's some probability associated with that. Or yeah, you move the, the cannonball and you think about what will happen with the pink sphere and you get some probabilities, again, through a simulator. It's just a question about is the simulator moving one or both of these bodies? And that gives you an equation of the probability that you should expect, okay? I'm going through this a bit quickly. I don't mean to overload you with the math, but this is pretty simple math, just to be clear. I'm sure any one of you, you look at this, this is like high school math. But what's nice is that it makes certain predictions. Certain, this sort of simple equation, this simple idea makes some very non-obvious predictions about the conjunction fallacy. And in particular, it says that sometimes you'll get the conjunction fallacy and sometimes you won't. And the degree, so over here, you can see on the y-axis is sort of like the magnitude of the conjunction fallacy. And if it's above zero, then people are being irrational, they're showing conjunction fallacy. If it's below zero, they're obeying the laws of probability in physics. And you can see that by manipulation of where you put these balls and how you start them and things like that, you can either get a conjunction fallacy or not a conjunction fallacy. And something that looks like a U-shaped curve. Again, completely non-obvious. And we put our money where our mouths are. We predicted this, we set this ahead of time, right? Like I know that there's all sorts of stuff in psychology now, but I'm very supportive of like writing down your predictions ahead of time. We wrote down everything ahead of time. We gathered the data, we predicted what we would find. And there's just a startling, you know, <laughs> look at these things, right? Like this is participants and this is the model. Like this is, you don't, you, I, I don't usually see these things, like even when they work out. So I'm, I'm quite pleased about how well this turned out to work. Now, I should say this doesn't negate um, the previous work of people who say we're not running an approximate simulation in the sense that I, I said I'm not going to use a, a pointer and I, I stick by it. But what I'm trying to say is that if you look sort of up there, that's the regime that they were working in. And we do recover the conjunction fallacy for that. So there is an area where people are sort of not obeying the laws of physics in that sense of probability, but there's all this other stuff that they're doing and you can just explain that by an approximate simulation. Cool. Okay. We have about, I think, 10, 15 minutes until question time. Okay, that's, that's perfect. That's, that's enough time for me to tell you about some cool new stuff. This is all published and like, has been out there for a few years. Again, I'm going to try and create breakpoints here. If you've sort of been spacing out for a bit, now's a good time to jump back in. The story so far is we're interested in how people reason about intuitive physics. We said that this knowledge is present early on and that the models that seem to explain both babies and adults seem to be that you're running something like a mental simulation that kind of quasi obeys the laws of physics, except it has all of these um, approximations in it that take on different forms. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit again, and I'm gonna talk about something that at first glance doesn't seem to have to do with intuitive physics and approximations. It has to do with the imagination. So if you don't care about physics, or if you do, if you care about the imagination, now's your time to jump back in. Okay. So this is from very recent work with John McCoy um, and Eric Bigelow about non-commitment in mental imagery. And it works like this. Okay, I'd like you all to imagine the following scene as vividly as you can. A person walks into a room and knocks a ball off a table. So please humor me. Right, close your eyes if that helps you. It doesn't help everyone, but if it helps you to imagine, close your eyes and imagine. A person walks into a room and knocks a ball off a table. Um, how many people here have aphantasia? You can't form visual images in your mind? I see. Few hands up. Okay, I have some questions for you later, but okay, good. So presumably, you know, you all had something in your mind. Let's say, um, you know, by show of hands, we're like over here is like it's very vivid, and over here is it's not vivid at all, and over here it's somewhere in between. Can you just raise your hand to the degree of like how vivid this is in your mind? I'm just going to quickly. Okay, good. So I want to ask you a few questions about this scene, right? And I want you to just like say yes or no, where the yes or no is about was this part of your mental image? Okay, you don't need to say, what was it? You just need to say, like, did you bother thinking about that? Or was that not part of the image? Okay? And try not to recreate it as I'm asking it. You'll see what I mean by that, but okay. So, for example, the color of the ball, yes or no? Okay, hearing some yes, hearing some no. A bit louder so that I can hear you, that's great. Okay, how about the, um, the position of the person relative to the ball? Okay. Um, the size of the ball? The clothes of the person? 
the hair color of the person, the gender of the person, the size of the table, the trajectory of the ball, like you can sort of show it with your fingers. Okay, we can keep going like this, right? You can hear some yeses, some noes for every one of these things. And what we're going to say is that like the noes is what we mean by non-commitment, right? The idea is that when you're creating a scene in your mind, right, an image in your mind, you're not committing to a lot of the details, is the argument. And this idea has been around in philosophy, of course, mostly in the philosophy of perception, like that you can look at a speckled hen. You know it's speckled, even though you can't say how many speckles that is. This is very interesting to philosophy for some reason. This is also apparent um, in The Purple Cow by Dan Dennett, right? But these are all sort of, and this also shows up in the imagery debate, for those of you who know it, right? Like there's been a huge argument in cognitive science for decades and decades and decades about what is the structure um, of our mental images. When we imagine something and we see it in our mind's eye, what is that? Is that more like a picture or more like a sentence? What is that? And within that argument, this idea of like, oh, you don't bother to imagine certain things has played kind of a bit role. But honestly, there's, as far as I know, there's been sort of no empirical work on that. It's just a bunch of guys arguing with one another and saying like, it seems to me the case that you can imagine this or not or something like that. So we tried, and this is, by the way, no, no disrespect, these are very important people, but yeah, it's just, you know, intuition. So we tried to get these sort of scenes in the same way that I showed, you know, I, I, the same thing that I did with you, I did with a thousand people, and we asked them about various properties of the scene, and this is the percentage of participants who responded, no, it was not part of my mental image. And the first thing I want you to take away from this is that there, for every property that we ask, some percentage of people said it was not part of my image, okay? So for every property, it's above zero. But it's also not random, right? It's not just like, you know, you just have some finite amount of mental imagery juice that you just use haphazardly. Nearly everyone can tell you, you know, the size of the ball. Nearly everyone says that they didn't think about the hair color of the person or their height or the color of the table. And you can repeat this, right? So for all properties, some people didn't commit to it and some properties more than others. And you can repeat this for many scenes, right? These are very different scenes. But we keep asking about very different properties and finding the same thing. So a bunch of other scenes and properties repeats this thing, right? And what's interesting to me about that, well, there's many things, by the way, you can test like, I'm skipping through this and we can come back to it in the questions if you're interested, because there's one more thing I want to show you after this. Very briefly, this doesn't really seem to relate to vividness. You might think this is about like, oh, how vividly can I imagine the picture? No. People say, I imagine the scene, it's super vivid, it's like it's in my head, like, a, like I'm seeing a movie. What was the color of the ball? I don't know. And I've asked people, they fantasia this, and they're like, look, I don't know if you know, there's this condition called aphantasia, I can't see anything in my mind's eye. What color was the ball? Red, why? It doesn't seem to track vividness, right? This seems to be about something else. And also interestingly, this seems to be very different if you, there's a lesson here for us cognitive scientists, it really matters how you ask people. Because if you just ask people, if you ask people, if you try this on your friends, be careful. Because if you ask them something like, you know, imagine a person walking into a room and blah, 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 and if you ask them what color was the ball, they'll say red. And if you ask them what was the clothes of the person, they'll say, oh, zipper bag with, you know, things like that. If you ask them the question, what was the content, they'll generate the content on the fly, okay? You need to ask them about like, was this part of your mental scene? Did you bother thinking about it? Because the way that we usually ask about it sort of assumes that you sort of know, but that causes people to generate that thing. They're confabulating in the same way as judgment and decision-making people have found for many years that people confabulate, okay? So for anything here, any question that we ask them about, if you just ask them about the content in that way, they will just give you an answer. All right. So from that, um, let's see. Why am I telling you about this in the context of, um, of, as I said, approximate bodies and things like that? So here, let me tell you, I'm going a little bit beyond the data, but it's active work that's happening in the lab right now. You might have noticed that you, most of you can say what the trajectory of the ball was, and most of you can say where the ball was relative to the person, but a lot fewer of you committed to things like, you know, the color of the ball, certainly less to the hair color of the person, the gender of the person. I think it's not a mistake that it's the spatial properties that are the ones that we commit to more. And that makes sense under a scene construction thing. So again, think of the engineer that in Pixar or in these video games, their boss comes to them and says, I need a video game about a hedgehog falling down a hill on a bicycle and things like that. And he comes back out and he comes back in, did you do it yet? And it's like, no boss, I'm working on it, right? And when they're working on it, they don't start painting pixel by pixel, right? They start to create a scene. They're like, all right, so there'll be a hedgehog and there'll be a bicycle and this will be over here and that'll be over there. Right, you need to go through a whole scene construction exercise to get to rendering, 
And these are two different things, by the way, rendering and physical tracking. Okay, so I think that this is related to basically like the fact that in a lot of imagery, what determines things is physics. Which brings me to my last thing, and this is very new stuff that was just submitted about visual pretense and how this might relate to approximate bodies in physics. And with that, we'll end and take some questions. So we're in that home stretch, okay? One last time, if you weren't tracking, now's your time to jump back in. We're talking about visual pretense and physical properties. This is work that's led by Peng Xiang. And it's basically, um, this, this is my daughter, by the way, so my son doesn't get all the airtime. Um, and this is from the airport in, in Vienna, I think, or somewhere in Austria or something like that. So the idea is like, we're, we're, we were really interested in this idea of visual pretense that is present from very early in childhood, but certainly up to adulthood, right? And let me, um, or let me try it with this, I guess, or I really shouldn't like mess with these objects. I'm bad in intuitive physics. I'm gonna spill the water here, but um, here, let me try this. Okay, do people see this thing that I'm holding over here, right? It's a pen, but suppose that I wanted to pretend that it's something else, okay? So I could pretend that it's something else, right? I might tell a friend of mine about a story about something that happened to me using this pen. Or you know what, let me, let me try this with a different thing. Here, let, let's try this. Do you see this block over here? Would it make more sense to pretend that this block is a car or a strawberry? Who thinks car? Raise your hand. Who thinks strawberry? Raise your hand. Are you doing that annoyingly to be like, a, no, I'm sorry. I, I, it's usually philosophers that do that. Um, so I'm gonna take it as philosophers. I apologize, I shouldn't have put it that way. The point is that like most people say it's car, but why? Not everyone. Most people say it's car, but why? Okay, so we're interested in that act of visual pretense of you sort of taking an object and saying this is something else. And we do it all the time. We do it in play and in imagination and in creativity and narratives, right? Like, this is the truck that nearly ran me over, right? And this is me and I'm walking to work, blah, blah, blah. And the question here is like, there's a puzzle here, right? First of all, is there going to be a preference in these pretense? And I'd like to impress on you that philosophically there doesn't have to be any kind of preference here. It makes just as much sense to pretend that that block is a strawberry as it is a car. The whole point about pretense is that it's a departure from reality. Right, there's no ground truth that tells us it should be a car. The whole point is that anything can be anything in imagination. Right, there's a lot of philosophers that argue that. But there's going to be other philosophers who say like, no, 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 look, our imagination is tethered to our understanding of reality. Right, the way we reason about things in our pretense is tied to how we understand the real world. Fine, several people have argued that. But that doesn't yet tell you, you know, that just predicts that there's going to be a difference. It doesn't tell you what that difference is going to be and why. So in this work, I'm going to give you a short spiel. It's going to be that we think that there are going to be some preferences that are systematically preferred, that this thing is going to be determined by a hierarchy of features, and that in this hierarchy, physical and spatial features matter a lot more than surface level visual features. And finally, that current machine learning, AI models, state of the art, generative stuff doesn't capture this human hierarchy. We did a whole bunch of experiments with hundreds of people. This was all pre-registered. I'd like to give you just one example. I'd like to walk you through quickly. The first experiment was very similar to the one that I did with the block, okay? So we showed people 50 everyday objects, and for every one of these objects, we'd ask them, does it make more sense to pretend that this thing is a blah or a blurg, right? And we got their preferences for that pretense. That was one task. We took a different group of people, and we asked them, which one of these things is this more similar to in terms of its shape? Okay, so is this bow tie more similar to a Dalmatian or a dragonfly in terms of its shape? Who thinks dragonfly, right? Who thinks Dalmatian in terms of shape? Okay, good. We did that also in terms of color, different groups of participants, and, and we got a large embedding model that can basically like slurp up a whole bunch of visual, surface level visual features that are not about spatial features. Okay, so this is an embedding model that can take words and images. So it took in the image of that bow tie and it took in the word Dalmatian and the word dragonfly, created a high dimensional space to try and compare them in terms of their distance. And what did we find? We found that shape is a very good predictor of people's pretense preferences. So basically the more similar two things are in shape, the more they count as like, it would make sense to pretend that this thing is that thing over there, okay? Color doesn't predict anything basically. And this kind of large language, sorry, this large generative model that's current state of the art, it does something, right? It's like 0 0.37 in terms of its correlation, much less, much, much less than the single physical property of shape, okay? This is kind of like all the visual features that the thing could eat up versus just shape. We did that for several different things. Another thing you might object to is that, you know, I told you, I said block, and I asked you, you know, strawberry or car. 
a lot of you might object, it's neither a strawberry nor a car, it's uh, something else, right? So in a, another experiment, we gave people, say, this spoon, and we asked them, what could you pretend, just freeform, generate, what could you pretend this to be? And they generate all kinds of things. This is a very long tail distribution. We can't do all of it, but we randomly sample that distribution for a lot of objects. We create these sort of triads, where some things make more sense than others, but it's still the kind of thing that a priori people come up with. So the spoon goes with the hammer, and the lemon goes with the spinning top. We put these triads together, that gives us a sense of, are these things the same in terms of what property? And it turns out that even in free form, the things that people come up with, just like pretend this is something else, it matches really well in terms of shape, not in terms of a visual surface level thing like, proper, like color. Color counts a little bit, but not that much. The final thing, and then I'll end, is that even, so we wanted to dig a bit further. Like, even if you think that really what determines when I'm reasoning about this object for the purposes of pretense is its approximate body and spatial alignment and things like that, I'm gonna pretend that it's something else. I'm gonna pretend that this is a swan, okay? So if I pretend that this is a swan, I'm not just taking this away and putting in its place a swan that can be anywhere, right? Obviously, the swan is going to have its beak over here and its head over here. You're doing an alignment, a spatial alignment of the subparts. Right? I see some nods, that's just me saying it. That seems intuitive, we wanted to test that idea. Right? So the thing that we're comparing is do people align the subparts or are they doing like a replacement? They take something in, they put something else. So we gave them the example of like, you know, this thing um, here, let me ask you. Um, the, suppose that this mug is an elephant, where do you think is its trunk? Could you point to where the trunk is for the mug? Okay, good, I'm gonna pretend that I can collect that data and I'm guessing that it was sort of bimodal like that, right, I saw some people pointing in somewhat different directions. You can compare that to language prompted in painting where we sort of take the mug away and we replace it with an elephant and that's just, I'm guessing not the elephant that any of you had in mind, right? We can do that for many, many different things. We can compare like people's pretense by just splitting them into two groups. To, and you know, this is like the level of their agreement with one another. We rotate the broccoli, we do all sorts of things. You can compare that to their sort of a priori sampling and we can compare this to cutting edge, you know, generative models like Dali and Stable Diffusion. And the point is that they're not doing very well. And what these graphs are telling you is that people seem to be aligning the subparts in a way that is not captured by current uh, models because they don't look at things like the physical subparts and the spatial parts. And now this idea would probably not surprise you. It wouldn't surprise, you know, people from 2000 years ago. And here I'm finally going to end with this quote from Ovid. Right, so those of you who's here has read the Metamorphosis, right? Uh, or knows about Apollo and Daphne, right? So this is from the latest uh, translation by uh, Stephanie McCarter, where this is the moment where Apollo catches Daphne and she's being turned into a tree, right? She prayed to the gods to help her, to save her from Apollo. She's being turned into a tree. And um, so it's slender bark enfolds her torso, her hair sprouts up as leaves, her arms as branches, a stiff root clasps her foot just now so swift, the treetop takes her mouth, just her gleam remains. And of course, it's not surprising that the arms become the branches and the hair becomes the treetop. It would be kind of weird if it was flipped around in some way. All right, and with that, where are we? We're done. So good job, everybody, we made it. And just a summary slide up there, I mentioned that mental game engines are this useful way of thinking about people's intuitive physics. I'm really interested in people's intuitive theories about the world. What's the underlying computations of those things? We focus specifically on physics. We could have spent the whole time talking about psychology. Even if you accept this notion, and it seems to be doing really well for people's, um, for capturing what babies know, this still relies on these sort of approximations. There's approximations in real world game engines. The claim is that the mind is using some of those approximations. And that these approximations, I think, are going to start showing up in a lot of our work on imagination and pretense, where I think a lot of the things that count are not so much the surface level visual features, but the spatial and physical features. And with that, we'll see.